Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the second event this semester and in, 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 in the uh, life of this uh, new project, Project on Shiism Global Affairs, here at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs uh, that will be approaching all uh, different aspects of Shiism, uh, whether Shia thought and identity, philosophy, Shiism and geopolitics, what's happening in the Middle East, uh, and uh, the global Shia diaspora from Shias in America, uh, Shias in Latin America and Europe. Uh, today, uh, we're very fortunate to have a unique uh, guest speaker, uh, Sayyid Ali Abbas Razavi, uh, who also uh, is an associate with us on the project, who will be specifically working on uh, our uh, interfaith work uh, and, and outreach and dialogue uh, between peoples of, uh, of a variety of faith and non-faith traditions. Uh, Sayyid Razavi is uh, the uh, chief imam and director of the Scottish Ahlubayt uh, uh, Society, and he is uh, a British religious leader uh, and is very active not only in uh, local community and, and state uh, civic society in the United Kingdom, but he is also active at interfaith initiatives globally, uh, as well as in international bodies uh, such as the United Nations. So um, we're very uh, fortunate to be able to, to hear his thoughts on uh, topics such as the one we have today that in many ways informs many of his uh, uh, lectures and, and, and presentations that he gives across the world. And that is about spirituality, the spirituality of the figure of Imam Ali, which, you know, as, as many of you know, is an important personality, not just within Shiism, but Islam. Uh, and uh, the talk will look at the relationship or nature and discussions of the personality of Imam Ali uh, and uh, compare that to uh, the philosophy of the perfect man in the mystical writing of Ibn Arabi. So let's uh, please welcome Sayyid Ali al Basrazid. In the name of God, the ever compassionate, the all loving, it's a great honor for me to be here today to look at a topic which is quite close to my heart. When we look at a personality like Ibn Arabi, Ibn Arabi, what comes straight to mind is kind of a, a philosophy of love and compassion. And so it's very fitting that you look at a personality like Imam Ali, because again, he's a man who has presented by Ibn Arabi is, is the perfect man, or the perfect being. And what the perfect being symbolizes is essentially the manifestation of God in human form. And what that human form is, really, is the overflow of divine love and compassion. So look, I think a controversial mystic who people call Sheikh Al-Akbar. But at the same time, controversy isn't something which is bad. I find controversy to be very good sometimes if it delivers the message. And here's a man that there's no, realistically looking at it, there's no chain after him of any order. So he's a temple to itself. And his humility is such that he made sure that there was no outward change. There's spiritual change which are inward, but in terms of the outward orders, there are no orders which go back to Ibn Arabi. And in the same way, the humility of the man 
he then begins to write and talk about Imam Ali, a man who nearly every single order, bar one, goes back to. So what you find straight away here is Baltin, the inner reality and the outer reality in the writings of Ibn Arabi. Imam Ali, as you know, arguably one of the most influential men on the planet, that if we have the development of an Islamic civilization, it's because of that man. If you look at the Islamic world, perhaps 1.5 billion Muslims, seven cultures, one dynasty, or multiple dynasties representing one civilization, from one end of the earth, and if you look at these seven cultures, you've got the Malay culture that also forms what Islam is today. Subcontinental cultures of Islam, which also form, pull into what this Islamic civilization was. You've got the Persian cultures, the Arab culture from Ben Ghazi in Libya to Baghdad, that was one block. The African cultures, the East European cultures. So we take all this together, that's what the face of Islam is today. That's what it symbolizes, multiplicity, but working in the state of unity, which is really the biggest philosophy, I guess, of what Ibn Arabi represents. The idea of multiplicity and unity, unity and multiplicity. And the Islamic civilization was like that. See, faith is something which is abstract, but the manifestation of that faith is something which is important. How do we manifest it? And every culture manifests it in a different way. And that's what you're seeing in the world. That's what you saw with the Islamic civilization. There's no one Islam. The interpretations are multiple. And so that's why philosophy, or these mystical philosophies like Ibn Arabi are important. Because what they do is they embody the whole. 1,000 years of a civilization, it's art, sciences, music, and dare I say it, the foundations of the Western world was essentially laid by Islamic philosophers when Europe was in the Dark Ages. And evolution takes place from two ports, really, if you look at Italy, and then if you look at Spain, two ports where Islamic philosophy, mysticism, came through. Ibn Arabi in and of itself is not saying something which is new. But if you go back a thousand years, what you find is that much work was being done in North Africa and in the Middle East with Persian philosophy, Egyptian philosophy, dating back to the cult of Osiris, or what people would say all the way back to Idris in the Islamic scriptures. You have the philosophy of the Greeks. And when all of this comes together, you realize there's a perennial wisdom which is flowing. Ibn Arabi was the door to open that, to show the world that, yes, there is a perennial wisdom. And that's why, when he writes his Fusus, he looks at all of these prophets. He looks at all the prophets, by one, mentioned in the Quran. And the purpose of him looking at that is to show that there is a perennial wisdom. There's a timeless wisdom that began at the very beginning of creation. And so that's exactly where I want to begin. So join me on a bit of a journey where I blend together two philosophies. One, Shia theology. That is what Imamology represents. And the other one, Ibn Arabi's mysticism or mystical philosophy. So where does it start? Let me paint to you, for you a picture. It starts off, I think, at the point of creation. And what many scholars of Ibn Arabi will begin with is the famous tradition that I was a hidden treasure. I love to be known, and so therefore God created. There's two things that come from here. God as a hidden treasure. What does that symbolize? That symbolizes God as an entity which pre-exists existence in and of itself. But there's two things that come into it. One is love, and the other one is God wanting to be known. So two things come forward here. The idea of love, that the entire universe was created on the basis of love. And the second thing is ma'rifah. Ma'rifah is something which is more than just ilmas, more than just knowledges. Ma'rifah is a divine type of knowledge. You see, you have two types of knowledge. One knowledge that you gain through your senses, your five senses, through a medium, basically. One knowledge is via a medium, experiences and so forth. One knowledge is direct that comes on the heart of a person. One knowledge is felt. In the words of Avicenna, if you were to take a child and suspend it in a vortex, let's say, without any sensation whatsoever, he can't see, he can't touch, he can't feel. But the fact is the child knows that it's itself. Why? There's a feeling inside of it. 
there's a recognition inside. And that is the deepest form of knowledge, knowledge by presence. The ability to know something so well that you know it is as much as you are. That divine consciousness. And when Descartes said what he did say, he was looking at the effect, but the cause is the I-ness. I think, therefore I am. No. The I-ness tells you that you're there before you even thought. The I-ness, the ability to know that you're you. And that's that knowledge by presence. And this is, I guess, something which, hey, God, when he talks about love, and he talks about marifa, two things come into play. That true knowledge cannot be attained until one doesn't truly understand the concept of love, or when one doesn't start loving. And this is why within Islamic scripture you find that there's actually multiple forms of love. And there's multiple forms of names of love as well. Three types of love you'll find though, is that love which is, you could find, animalistic, haywani, which develops then to nafsani, the idea of the nafs and the love that the nafs has, which then bridges onto the love of God, the love of the absolute. So there's three levels. But if I was to ask you a question, can somebody who's an animalistic love get to the love of God straight away? The answer is yes, you can actually, or she can. Why? Because it goes back to a tradition, a very famous tradition, which is found within mystical text and across the different denominations that says that it, if a person became a lover, fell in love, and they had haya, so haya would mean basically that shame on that love, in the sense that they didn't disclose it, they hid that love, and they protected that love, and they died in that state, mata shahida. They died the death of a shaheed, a martyr. But here shaheed means a person who continuously witnesses the face of God. So love, whether it's for a person or whether it's for God, if it's harnessed in the right way, can actually elevate you to that love of God. What it requires, nevertheless, is the ability to hold it and the ability to keep it unique for yourself. So here what the tradition says is, it's when you begin to share that love to others is when it loses degree with the beloved. And if you look at Ibn Arabi, his entire life really was what? Who knew him? Very few people did. Other than his students, no one did. It was only after his death that the beloved made his name famous. In his lifetime, there were very few people who knew him. He wandered. He was, for all intents and purposes, a poor man, wandering, like a beggar would, with a bowl in his hand, very little clothing. If you look at his life, it was difficult. But the fact was that there was a love, and that overflow of love is what the beloved liked. So everything begins there, at that point, that God is a hidden treasure, and he loves to be known. Two things then come into play, that the entire veins of the universe pump the blood of love, and at the same time, the ability to come to know God. So here when Ibn Arabi is giving his commentary on a particular verse of the Quran that says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ So why did God create? Well, he only created the jinn and ins for one purpose, and that was to worship him. But if I was to ask you a question, is that a selling point? You know, God created you to worship. Would anyone come to religion? No. So here you find in a tradition that it goes deeper, and it discusses what the concept of worship means. And the concept of worship is very simple, according to Imam Hussain. It says, look, the concept of worship is this. It says that when you come to know somebody, when you come to know God, then you begin to love God. And when you begin to love God, you begin to worship God. And at that stage, you worship nothing other than God. Why? Two components are important, love and to know. Angels are the very same thing. That's why there's a relationship between angels and man. But human beings are insan kamil, not the angels. Human beings are the best in all of creation and not the angels. You see, the angels also love God. There's two things which are required to love God. The first thing is what? The ability to have free will. Without free will, you can't love freely. It requires free will. Second thing, to know what you're loving. And this is why every human being loves in a separate way. Because we see a uniqueness that pushes you to love someone. And here in this way, the very famous story of Layli and Majnun come to play. That somebody asked Majnun, the famous Romeo, he says, what do you see in your Juliet? There's nothing impressive about her, to paraphrase what the discussion was. And he said, you've got to look through the eyes of Majnun to understand what Lely is. Why? Love is unique. 
And in the same way, the love of God is unique. So when Ibn Arabi looks at the Quran, it's as if he feels the Quran is revealed to him. And it's an entire love poetry almost. This Quran speaks to him. Why? Because it's unique in the way that we love. Each one of us love in a very unique way. That doesn't mean that you shove your interpretation down somebody else's throat. But that means that God is speaking to you in a particular way. And that language of love needs to be understood. And it's very unique for everyone. Nobody has the same experience ever. And this is why every manifestation of God is unique on the person. Many mystics will elaborate on this to say that every experience that they have is very unique. No one person experiences in the same way. And this is why no one person has the same methodology or prescription, especially within the mystical realm. Everyone is different. But there is a perennial reality there, that every mysticism that we have pertains back to one, and that is the state of unity. And so look, if we put that tradition to one side, what does God do essentially? God manifests himself. What happens when he manifests himself? Existence comes into being. And what you find is that there's manifestations on manifestations. So if we say there's three layers to God, his essence, his characteristics, and his name, from the essence which is hidden. In fact, there's a concept that Sohrawardi talks about known as the black nur, the black light. That light gets so concentrated that it becomes the black light, where there's nothing but light. The first man, and it blinds. That light blinds, and there's nothing in existence. Why? Because of the power of that light. But the first manifestation of that light created what Ibn Arabi talks about, other names and the attributes of God. And these names and attributes of God then actualize themselves and produce creation as you have it. Alam et Kon, the world of existence. For the names to actualize themselves in and of itself is their perfection. So I'll give you an example. Two names that come is the name Rahman, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. If it was just the fact that God is merciful, without implementing it, without actualizing it, is He truly merciful? To give you an example, you may be a great-grandfather in potentiality, or a great-grandmother, until you don't have a great-grandchild. In actuality, is not the case. God, in all of His names, actualizes names in creation. And through the actualization of these names, we come to recognize truly the the divinity or the majesty of God. And so in this way, God's names are separated into two, Jalal and Jamal. You've got the names of majesty and you've got the name of beauty. And in all of creation rotate between these two names, one of majesty and one of beauty. So when God created this universe, it was scattered, completely different levels. You had the Malakut, uh, to begin with the Mulk, the Malakut, the Jabarut, the Hahut, Lahut, this entire span of existence. And it came from multiplicity to unity, so it's like a triangle. So if you look at the pyramid, it's very telling. Whoever made those pyramids understood the cosmology, or the mystical cosmology, that you start off on multiplicity and you work towards unity. God is at the state of unity, but when he created, it was multiplicity. From that multiplicity of creation, every level has its different laws. Mulk, this world that we live in, consists of two things, form and matter. But when you go to the next realm, which is Malakut, what happens? Matter stops, form is there. It's like when you dream, when you close your eyes. You can eat that shawarma, but the fact is, it's not tangible. And then the higher up you go, you go to the realm of light, where there's no form and there's no matter. And this is where time ceases to exist in the way that we see time. So these are the various stages, and we can go deeper, but it's the conclusion I want to get to. And that is this, with all this multiplicity created, what did God then do? According to Ibn Arabi, he created Adam. And what was Adam? The perfect person. To say the perfect man is wrong. Insan is not man, it's genderless. It's not male, it's not female. It's that perfect person. But he created Adam for all intents and purposes. What was Adam then? Adam was the Ismajam that brings together the collective names of God onto the state of unity. Adam symbolizes the manifestation of Allah itself. Allah is what? Is that name of gathering that brings together all of the names and qualities of God into one locus. And so Adam itself was the same thing. The universe was created, and to bring it together is very important. Why? Because remember, Muslims and Islam believe in Tawheed, oneness. Oneness has to be at every level. Oneness isn't just a philosophical concept. Oneness is a state of being. The negation 
of everything which is other and the affirmation. And that's why it's important. So what happens there? Adam is created. Adam is the polish of the universe. More so, Adam is the mirror of God. God looks into the mirror of Adam and he sees all of his names. But Adam is the place, the locus of gathering. So what you find is that the Adamic reality is the most important. The reason being is this, that multiplicity comes into unity with an Adam. So Adam becomes a perfect person. But if you look at the philosophy of Ibn Arabi, he mentions multiple perfect people. But he says that even before Adam was a reality. In fact, the first substance that God created that everything came out of, the seed. So he puts the seed forward. And from the seed, the trees came and the roots came and the apples came and so forth. If you take it a seed, that first seed, the kun, b, is what? The haqiqat of Muhammad, the Muhammadan reality. And that is the archetype of all of creation that contains everything. The reality of everything, time itself, because as you know, in the physical world, time is subject to distance, speed, movement, and so forth. Time itself is a creation. This is why Imam Ali very famously says, he uses the characteristics of God in the same way the Prophet did before him. And he says, Ana awwal wa akhir, Allah wa batin. He says, I'm the first and the last, and the apparent and the hidden. So you could turn around and say, well, look, isn't that shirk? No. Actually, it's not. Why? Because God's names, when they manifest themselves, there are various different levels to those names. What he was saying was true, because in creation, the haqiqat of Muhammad symbolizes, as Ibn Arabi says, this, he goes back to the prophetic tradition, that I and Ali are from the same nur, light. What is light? The metaphysical light is that light which makes things apparent, which makes existence as it is. Look, if I close all the lights in this room, you don't know who exists, or who does exist. The minute the light opens, all of a sudden you see existence in front of you. The same thing, God was a hidden treasure. He put on the lights of creation. What happened? When the nur came, when the light came, then everything came into existence. This is why there's an entire school of illumination. And if you go to Kabbalah, they talk a lot about light. Not to break with the light, why? What is this light? Light that connects you to God? That light connects you to guidance. It is existence itself, brings into existence. So what did God create? Just a kun. Kaf, nun, kun, bi. What was it? Aghir the Muhammadin. The Muhammadin reality. And from that, everything then begins to flow. The actualization of the Muhammadin reality is the perfect man. See, so the Muhammadin reality itself is the archetype. And the manifestation of that in the physical world, the actualization of that, is the perfect man. And so there's various degrees of actualization that you find in all of the prophets, from Adam all the way down to Jesus. However, the prophet Muhammad itself is the actualization of the Muhammadan reality. And so here you have it. The first substance that's created, the first seed that's created. And in the philosophy of Ibn Arabi, what is the Muhammadan reality? It is a barrier between the creator and the created, as they call it, the barzakh. It is the barzakh. It is that barrier, it's that hijab between the creator and the created. It's the medium that God channels his light through. Or you could say filters it, otherwise God in and of itself is so powerful, nothing would be left. There's a filtration system that takes place. So what happens? That is the idea of the perfect man. That in and of itself is the idea of the Mohammedan reality. It's what, it, what we call a barzakh. In fact, you could even say it's a bridge between the creator and created. So from here you find that this flow comes, this overflow. The first thing, if you look at the Quran, you'll see, and the same thing Ibn Arabi uses, he says, call God Allah or Rahman. All of these names are the beautiful names of God. Why? When creation looks up towards God, it's his mercy. That's why the name Rahman comes in, Rahmani of God. There's a reason why the Quran starts with the name of mercy. And because it's the name of mercy that is actually the mover into creation. The entire world that you have it is created in the name of mercy. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad was known as mercy on all of mankind, Rahmat lil alameen. The pur purpose of that, mercy unto all of creation. By default, therefore, if the light is one, then Imam Ali in and of itself, after the Prophet, becomes the mercy upon all of mankind. And here you find a theology of compassion and mercy. Where mercy is, love also follows. Compassion also follows. 
These are some of the virtues which come together or are bunched together. So really God created everything on the basis of his mercy, on the basis of his love. One question that comes here is that why is there names of wrath? <clears throat> and the best example one can give is like this. That God gives mercy to all of creation. It's like your blood being pumped in your arteries. But sometimes you may eat certain food or do certain things or have certain stress that builds, if you look at it, cholesterol. And there you see a constriction taking place. There's certain deeds that we do that constrict. The mercy of God is still coming. But that constriction, because of our own deeds, is what leads to the names of wrath. Otherwise, the primacy is in the names of mercy. And even then, if you look at what Ibn Arabi says, he says, look, you know, when I look at the names of mercy of God, he goes as far as saying that I can't even see that there's a hell because of the fact that God is so merciful. And that's a belief. And remember, we all look at God in our own perception. We understand God as to who we perceive God to be. And if that's our perception of God, that is what God, or that is how God will treat us. And this is why time and time again there's an emphasis. Have faith in God. Be good to God. Or at least have a good perception because that is exactly how it's going to manifest. That's one side of the philosophy. Let's look at the other side of the coin. The Imamology side. What is Imam Ali? Imam Ali itself is an Imam. Imam here in the Shi'i term is a person who is appointed by God not by the people. There's four different qualities that come of an imam. The first is that he's appointed by God. The second is the infallibility of the imam. Ibn Arabi agrees with the perfect man example as being ma'asum, infallible. And you'll see that if you go to Futuhat al makiyah there's two copies of it. One is the four volume, one is the nine volume. In both volumes four and six, so respectively, you, you find the concept of the Mahdi or the coming of the Twelfth. And in that he talks about the Mahdi being Ma'asum, and in that he talks about the Mahdi being the Twelfth, and in that he talks about Mahdi being the son of Hassan al-Asghari, which is quite different from the common understanding, whereby within most Sunni traditions or Sufi traditions, what you find is that the Mahdi in and of itself is the son of Abdullah. So it would be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Here you find a difference in the philosophy of Ibn Arabi. And when he talks about the last days, he talks about the coming of a Mahdi. That Mahdi who's appointed by God, that Mahdi who's infallible. So the third quality within Shia studies, which you find again within the philosophy of Ibn Arabi when it comes to the Mahdi, is what? Is the fact that the Imam has ilm al dunni So there's two types of knowledge that the Imam has. One is inherited from Adam. So it's passed down from prophet to prophet to prophet. The other type of knowledge is a direct knowledge by presence, where they're connected to God. And again, that stimulates again the discussion of the perfect person, or the perfect man. What is the perfect man? But the final, let me just touch on the final. The final quality of the Imam is a person who's spiritually advanced. He has to be the most advanced in all of creation to be a guide. Why? Because he parallels the Prophet. And so there are four qualities there. Now look at the perfect man of Ibn Arabi and you'll see the very four qualities exist. Where Shiism and Ibn Arabi stem off is that he says that the idea of Al-Insan Al-Kamil is only for the Prophet and Imam Ali. Where within Shias, or at least the orthodoxy today, they believe all 12, including the Prophet, are perfect people. If the Mahdi, according to Ibn Arabi, has these qualities of being chosen by God, of having direct knowledge with God, being the perfect person, then according to him, Imam Ali's status is higher than the Mahdi's. And in this way, the same principle then applies. So here the perfect man is what? The perfect man is the manifestation of God. All of its names and all of its attributes. Because the Hafiqat in Muhammadiyah outdates time itself and the physical world and the metaphysical realms, it was there at the very beginning and will be there at the very end. And because it's through the substance, the DNA, the original DNA of creation is the Hafiqat in Muhammadiyah, then the perfect man is found within all of us. That DNA is in, with, in seven billion people. And you seven billion people are what? The Adamic reality. But if you take that to unity, it's one Adam. Scatter one Adam in creation, seven billion of us. We contain a substance that unites us as well. Within all of our multiplicity, there's a unity there. And this is why within the mystical journey, you start off by seeing multiplicity 
and then you see the unity. And then you come back and you begin to see dual. The unity in multiplicity and multiplicity in unity. So here, what is the perfect person? In terms of Imam Ali, the description of the perfect man is very simple. He's the source. He's the source, or you could say the Lahore, of the names and the characteristics of God. It's where the names and the characteristics of God come to life. From potentiality into actuality. That is what the perfect man symbolizes. And that is what Imam Ali is for Ibn Arabi. A person who actualizes all of the names and all of the characteristics of God. On a practical level, what does that mean? On a practical level, that is the compassion of the Imam. You know, there would be multiple books written on that. There's multiple treaties and different letters that he gives. But the most important thing is here. The Imam itself symbolizes compassion and love. And it's the theology of compassion and love which is important. For Ibn Arabi, that is the main thing. It's the overflow of divine love. It's the ontological love and the ontological mercy. And the perfect man symbolizes that. Within the perfect man, in the heart of the perfect man, is where God is manifest. It's that mirror. And so therefore, within his actions and his qualities, he was meant to be like that. When he walked, it was as if the entire universe was walking. And when he talked, it was as if God was talking. And this is why you have descriptions of him being the tongue of God, or the hand of God, or the eyes of God. Because you get to a stage, the perfect person, or the, the perfect man, as opposed to perfect people, in Ibn Arabi's opinion, there's only two who are the perfect people, as opposed to a perfect man. And that's Muhammad, or the Prophet Muhammad, and Imam Ali. Why? One nur, one light. One light that brings into existence. So now you can see why Ibn Arabi mentions that these, this is that light that takes you from darkness and guides your heart towards peace, guides your heart towards light, guides your heart towards perfection. Is perfection possible? God is meant to be perfect. Why? Because he's absolute. Can a human being reach perfection? Of course they can. I believe they can. Everything has its perfection. A glass's perfection is that it fills to the top. A knife's perfection is that it cuts. Everything has its perfection. What is the human perfection, therefore? Human perfection is to be able to manifest the infinite names and the attributes of God. If your heart can become a mirror of God, what then happens? You're like the wave in an ocean, that you may have your separate identity, but in essence you're part of the ocean. That is what's important. I wouldn't go as far as to say that we become God, but again, I wouldn't say that we're separate from Him either. The other example that the mystics give is like the sun. The rays of the sun are the sun, but they have its own independent reality as well. In the face of the sun, nothing has its a reality. But taken individually, each one of us do. The absolute God, who is absolute existence in and of itself, in front of that, we have no reality. But individually, yes, we have a reality which is tied onto God's. Our existence in and of itself is what the philosophers would call an existence of poverty. Our hand is always there for God to keep on filling. And as long as that connection is there that God is giving, that Ghani is giving that who is poor, then what you find is that existence continues to exist. So look, I'm not going to elongate this discussion. The final thing I will say is this though. If you look at the philosophy, that's one thing, but there's a practical element to it as well. And that's where the practical Sufism of Ibn Arabi comes forward. And that is the practical nature of Imam Ali's philosophy too. In the words of Hinduism, the first stage is karma yoga, the idea of helping other people, selflessness. And you see that within the futu of the imam, and you see that discussed by Ibn Arabi, the first stage of enlightenment is to serve other people, to help other people. There was a time when the Darvish or the Sufi for the first year would go out serving people. Why? To break his ego or her ego. And so if you look at the life, the initial life of the Imam, there he was serving, helping, teaching. And then you have evolutions that take place. The first stage is the stage of khidmah, service. And what that does 
is it softens the heart and it breaks the ego. Why is it important to break the ego? Because the ego leads to duality. Duality needs to be destroyed so that there's only unity, so that you become the divine ego. So your actions become selfless to the extent that it reflects the will of God. Why? Because your soul is the will of God. But it's got to be actualized. And inside each one of us rests that light from the very beginning. The haqiqah that Muhammad is in all of us. To degrees it needs to be understood. As is God's names, you find that there's different grades to it. We also in our life manifest different grades and shades of the names and attributes of God. There are people in this room who are compassionate. Why is that? Compassion is a virtue. Goes back to the image of God, if I was to use a Christian term. The image of God is not just the physical form of God. In fact, our interpretation of that wouldn't be the physical form. It is the multiple attributes, names, and qualities of God. When you describe something, how do you describe it? In terms of its qualities, in terms of its virtues, in terms of its description, when you bring it forward. So in the same way, how do you describe God? What is the face of God? The names and the attributes. And where do they come together? In the perfect man. But each one of us has compassion, love, kindness, to give. We have all of those qualities inside of us at different grades. The only difference is that the perfect man has all of those characteristics and names in a state of harmony. And that's what we need to reach, that state of harmony. It is about balancing the multiple names inside of ourselves. In the same way that you take vitamins A to Z or A to Z, just so that you can balance your physical body, in the same way, the multiple dimensions of the human soul require balancing. When there's a disbalance, it leads to spiritual depression and other things. To balance is important. What the perfect man does, or the woman, perfect woman, Fatima being the perfect woman, if we look at the whole, the idea of the perfect people, or look at the five within the Shia tradition, what happens is that the perfect man or woman balances human beings. Their infinite names and qualities inside are balanced. And when you get to that balance, only then can you truly understand what the haqiqah is, the reality, true reality is, the truth is. And so you find the Sufis will call God the truth. They don't directly call him God. The mystics use the term the truth. Why? Truth breaks all barriers. Truth contains everything in it. Truth has all the virtues. And truth is real. And so in this way, they're making a statement here when the mystics say, they are saying there's an objective truth in creation, and that objective truth is God. So in a nutshell, the discussion is a deep one. I wish we could go longer. But as I've been told to leave some space and time for, for question and answers, if I can, what I'll do at this stage is I'll open up the floor to you. I hope that's been beneficial. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.